We hebben het bericht ontvangen dat dominee Schuller overleden is. Dominee Schuller, hij werd geboren op 16 september 1926. En wat een grote man is het geworden. Wat een betekenis heeft hij gehad voor de hele wereld. Wat een bijzondere predikant. Een man die zoveel mensenlevens en zoveel harten heeft geraakt. Ook hier in Nederland. Een geliefde predikant. Waar we trots en dankbaar op terug mogen kijken. Op een leven dat uh, heel veel vrucht heeft gedragen. Als we kijken hoeveel mensen er zijn aangeraakt door zijn boodschap. Zijn boodschap van geloof, van hoop, van liefde, van denken in mogelijkheden. Van onbegrensde energie en enthousiasme, gegrond in het woord van God. Dan kijken we met grote dankbaarheid terug als Out of Power Nederland op dominee Schuller. Vele malen kwam hij naar Nederland... Ik herinner me een prachtig moment dat in de keukenhof totaal tot zijn verrassing een tulp zijn naam kreeg. Ik herinner me dat prachtige moment dat we met 750 Nederlanders in de Christelijke Tiedel waren. Om daar zijn 50-jarig jubileum te vieren als predikant. En hoe ontroerd hij was. En iedere keer als hij Hollanders ontmoette, dan kwamen de tranen. Omdat hij zich zo hecht verbonden voelde met het land waar zijn ouders vandaan kwamen. Hij sprak ook nog een aantal woorden Nederlands. Dominee Schuller is uitgesproken. En toch niet. De legende leeft alleen niet voort, ook hij. Want hij had een onverwoestbaar vertrouwen dat dit leven niet zomaar iets is om te leven en dood te gaan, maar dat de eeuwigheid wacht. Zoals hij altijd bij zijn gebed zei, aan het einde van de dienst. Op die dag dat je voor Jezus staat, waarin er geen zonsondergang en geen zonsopgang meer zal zijn. Wij gedenken, dominee Schuller, met diepe, diepe dankbaarheid. Een bijzonder mens is van ons heen gegaan. Maar, en dat is het mooie, het werk leeft voort. Het werk van Auer of Power gaat door. Gaat door om mensen tot in de verste uithoeken van de wereld te bereiken. Dat was zijn droom, dat was zijn visie. Een wereldwijde kerkdienst. En laten we gezamenlijk de schouders zetten onder Auer of Power... Dat zou de wens zijn van dominee Schuller. Dominee Schuller die zoveel bijzondere mensen heeft ontmoet. Moeder Teresa, president Gorbatschow, wereldleiders, acteurs, politieke leiders. En altijd gewoon dominee Schuller bleef. Die harten wist te bereiken en dingen uit mensen wist te halen die ze nog nooit aan iemand hadden verteld. En dat maakt hem ook zo uniek. Zijn menselijke, warme, hartelijke betrokkenheid. En nogmaals, als Out of Power Nederland, directie, bestuur en medewerkers zijn we bijzonder dankbaar voor het leven wat ons door dominee Schuller werd getoond in harmonie met God en de naaste. I believed in my husband, but I wondered if his drive and idea wasn't completely off the wall. I didn't know. I had to just pray a lot and uh, trust God. So uh, the first service we held in the Orange Drive-In Theater, March 27, 1955, uh, we made news in the church page the day before where the then Santa Ana Register said, religion along with banking and hamburgers is taking to the drive-in tomorrow. The very first service at the drive-in was exciting because we had another choir coming in, so I could just be at the organ, and uh, Bob made his own pulpit, he made his own, he built the cross with his own hammer and saw, and we were so busy that we hardly had time to be afraid. I asked a choir from one of our Reformed churches to come and sing for us. So, and I said, if you'd all come in separate cars, <laughs> I wanted somebody there, and they came in about 30 cars, and there were another 20 cars, about 50 cars. As the drive-in services continued, I found them very, very meaningful. There was something there that was just uh, electric and, and beautiful. People would come out of their cars just to meet each other. Uh, we would go to the different cars and say hello. And there was a real camaraderie. It was amazing how, how we became a community. We became a church. We cared for each other. Actually, it was in the spring of 56. We had come to California 
uh, you know, the year before in 55. That spring of 56, our three-year-old son got the mumps. Well, we couldn't take him to Sunday school anywhere with the mumps, but he wasn't really sick. So my husband said, let's put him in the car and we'll go to that crazy drive-in church. So that's what we did that morning. We were welcomed in with such a warm welcome and enjoyed the service so much that when we left, as we drove out, my husband said, there's a man that's going someplace. And he said, I want to be a part of it. And so we never went anywhere else. But there were two families that came and helped us and uh, they were wonderful. And uh, they did the ushering, they took up the offering, they greeted people and the wives uh, taught Sunday school, they took the children out of the cars. We uh, thumbtacked our papers to the picnic tables that were under the trees, but before we could do that, I had to whisk room everything off to be sure it was clean. Thumbtack the uh, papers to, so the wind wouldn't blow them away. And uh, I think I probably had, it was either seven or eight little little toddlers. Your sister, older sister was one of them, and my she son, was. and then a few other little, little ones. It was a wonderful time. People are the important part. That hasn't changed. No, that hasn't changed. And so many people who have shared with me are indicating how the Lord has helped them so much and that's why they're still here. And I see that. And I, I'm sure that that is, is the basis for our, our um, um, success of the church and everything, is that strong base in Christ. Welcome to an hour of power. Each week at this time, we join Robert Schuler in an hour of inspiration for daily living. Learn how you can pack your life with the power of possibility thinking. Find the answers you've been looking for. Stay tuned. We have good news for you today. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This motor drive-in church is another idea. It is... Come in motors, you, and bring your pew. <laughs> it's an exciting and historic day here in Garden Grove, California. Thousands of people are arriving to celebrate the dedication of the Crystal Cathedral. We invite you to join Robert Schuler for a Christian experience in possibility thinking. For today, Dr. Robert Harold Schuler, senior pastor of this magnificent Crystal Cathedral and hour of power television ministry worldwide. Today, this is your life. Power 
Jesus Christ. En waarom volg ik Jezus Christus? First, in de eerste plaats. I was the last child of five children. Ik was het laatste kind van vijf kinderen. And my mother would lift me up and put me on the piano bench. En mijn moeder dat pakte me op en legde mij op de piano kruk. Uh, she would si- play and sing some of the Dutch songs. En zij zat daar dan en speelde van die Hollandse liederen. I still remember a melody. En ik herinner de melodieën nog wel. Dom 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 dom. Right? En dat heeft geen vertaling nodig. <laughs> but then she would sing Jesus loves me. En dan zong ze Jezus houdt van mij. And I learned to love Jesus. En ik leerde om Jezus lief te hebben. All my life I loved Jesus. En mijn hele leven heb ik van Jezus gehouden. And I learned that from my mother's lips. En dat heb ik uit de mond van mijn moeder geleerd. And her heart. En uit haar hart. Goedemorgen. Hoe gaat het met u? Oh, het is een mooie dag. Het is een fantastische dag. Sure, ja. Yeah. Ja. Yeah. <laughs> en ik ben in een goede kerk, zo. So. En wij, wij zijn allemaal in de, in de goede kerk. Yeah. Dit is een fantastische kerk. Sure. En we zijn ongelooflijk blij. Wat zeggen wij dan? Dat is leuk. What are you doing here in Tijuana, Mexico? Well, I have come here for the sisters and the fathers and all of us to give tender love and care to the poorest of the poor, to give Jesus to them. Because I find they are hungry for love, hungry for, they are hungry for bread also. But they are beautiful people just left alone. And I want to be his love, his compassion, his presence to them all. You are a missionary. Yes. What is a missionary? A missionary is a person who carries the word of God and the life of God and brings that presence through his 
works of love, to works of faith. So, because faith in action is love, mm. and love in action is service, mm. and love and fruit of service is peace. So that's why it is wonderful to put faith into a living action that comes from prayer. I never forget one day I, uh, I met a man in the street in London, and uh, I looked so terrible. And then I went to him and I took his hand, and my hands are always very warm. And then he said, oh, after a long, long time, I feel the warmth of a human hand. And he sat up and he gave me such a beautiful smile. But I don't know how many times he said, long, long. He had a big lamp. And I said, uh, don't you light this lamp? And he said, for whom? For years nobody has come mm. at this time. I said, will you light the lamp if I send the sisters to you? He said, yes. So every night the light was lamp. The sisters went to see him. And then after two years he sent me word Tell my friend, the light she has lit in my life is still burning. Mm. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is what the people are hungry for. It was messages from Moscow and Paris and BBC London. We have to respect it, honor it, and uh, support it, because it is tough work. For as much as you, Robert, and you, Arvella, are fulfilling the commitment together according to God's holy ordinance of marriage, and have confirmed the same by making solemn vows before God in this company. I pronounce you husband and wife again. <laughs> in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what God has joined together and kept together for the last 50 years, He will surely keep together for eternity. Now, you may kiss your bride. <laughs>
are trying to push things forward, to push the horses forward, so to say, too fast. But even in such days, I was not alone, because I had Raisa with me, I had Irina with me, and I had my family with me. Yes. And you had your mother's prayers with you. You had Мать, the mother who Мать prayed очень, for you. Очень, очень my mother was profoundly affected. But she decided not to come to Moscow. She said, I would not want to leave this land where all of us were born, where the graves of our fathers are, and where our soil, our land is. I have learned something in my years of spiritual studies. And that is that prayer, prayer works wonders. And when I look at your life, I see your life as an answer to prayer. You have called yourself an atheist, time, may not believe in God as we think of him, but God's hand has been on your life. He has used you. He loves you. Why did you say yes and let me be the first preacher to preach on Russia? Tell why? Потому же, что я, почему и решил принять закон о свободе совести и вероисповедания. Надо уважать, уважать своих граждан. It happened for the same reason that we adopted that law on freedom of religion and freedom of faith. We have to respect our people, we have to respect our citizens, and many among them are believers, men, of, men and women of faith. And there can be no freedom without spiritual freedom, without human beings being able to choose. So respect is the most important thing. Greetings from the Russian Ministry of the Hour of Power. We have been full time on the air in the Russian language in the territory of the former Soviet Union since 1992. Our program in Russian can be viewed today in 70 million households our program has become completely self-sustaining and supported by viewers here in Russia. We have letters coming in every day with support, gratitude, and blessings. Building peace is the greatest piece of architecture of love. Very good. And for that reason, I was so pleased and honored to accept your invitation. Thank you, thank you. Well, you've been with Israel from the beginning. What are the greatest senses of pride and accomplishment, and what are the greatest disappointments? The greatest pride, it may sound a little bit strange, is our return to our language, to the language of the prophets. The second is to Ingada, the exiles of Jewish people all over the world. After a terrible history of persecution, of Holocaust, to see them coming together to their land, to their history, to their mission. 
And the third is that we could have made a gain, a living by ourselves, defending our lives, and trying to bring peace and hope to the whole of the Middle East. Our greatest disappointments are wars and hatred and victims on both sides. I wish we could have saved it. And I think this is our remaining most important mission, to make this old region a region of a spirit and a region of peace, to give hope to the people. Fight terrorists, don't fight the people. We are fighting the Palestinian terrorists. We are not fighting the Palestinian people. On the contrary, give to the people a hope. Suggest to the people a future. Show them that by getting rid of terrorists, they can become their own self, joining in a new age with such a great promise of unlimited technological and scientific development. There's a, a dynamic young minister that you've got to hear, you've got to see. And she asked me to come with her on a Sunday. Think about the positive thinkers. This man has put it into our minds that we can be anything we set our minds to be. But the thing that's always stood out is your positive faith messages. Never did I leave this church feeling down on myself. I always felt up. I felt like I could do anything because of you. We get it here, but you think about all around the world, the message is there, and it's delivered in such a manner like no one else. The Hour of Power is touching lives in the far corners of the world, from Asia to Africa, Russia to Germany, and Holland to Australia. The mission of the Hour of Power remains the same, to transform people's lives with the powerful positive gospel of Jesus Christ. As an anchor, the church has been an anchor of hope for so many years, for so many people all over the world. There's an anchor. Is there a story with that yes, beautiful? There is. I don't wear jewelry, but I received a call once from somebody in Rome, Italy, and uh, they said, We watch you on television and we have a gift for you. If we come to America, can we give it to you? Put it in your hand. And I said, Sure. So they came and they put this in my hand and they told me this story. The man said I was, had no religion, didn't believe in God. And finally I decided I, to kill myself. And I would shoot myself. I got the gun and I thought, I'll do it on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock won't bother anybody on Sunday morning at 11. So he said, I put the television set and set it to this channel, but left the power off. And then I put a gun in my one hand at the temple. I can still feel the iron on the skin. And with the other hand, I'd put the television on, volume full, so nobody would hear the shot. And I pushed the button, but before I could pull the trigger, you came on television and you were yelling, this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I couldn't pull the trigger. Next Sunday, I'll do it next Sunday. Next Sunday, the same thing. I fell on the floor and said, Jesus, I don't know you, but I want to. I need to be saved. I'm a lost soul. And he said, something went through me. I was different. I felt wonderful. 
went to my jeweler. I'm rich. Said, is there a symbol in the Bible for hope? Oh, sure, he said. It's the anchor. I said, then make me an anchor. Make it out of solid gold. Make a special link of chains. And on the front of the gold anchor, put the initials RHS for Robert Harold Schuller. He brought hope into my heart and saved my life. In verband met het overlijden van dominee Schuller besteden we in deze uitzending alle aandacht aan hun eh, betekenis en het werk van dominee Schuller. Die zo geliefd was wereldwijd en ook in Nederland. En heeft juist een aantal hoogtepunten gezien uit zijn leven. Ook voor Nederland had dominee Schuller een bijzondere betekenis. Vele duizenden Nederlanders hebben hem ontmoet en altijd had hij tijd voor een gesprek en voor een bemoedigend woord. En u gaat nu een aantal fragmenten uit uitzendingen zien waarin Nederlanders vertellen wat Hour of Power en wat dominee Schuller voor hen betekende. Van harte welkom op deze eerste paasmorgen bij de eerste uitzending van Hour of Power. Dankzij de vele steunbetuigingen hopen we vanaf nu elke zondagmorgen van 9 tot 10 uur Hour of Power bij u thuis te brengen. Nu is er perspectief uitkomst, hoop, vertrouwen, geluk dat wacht. Ja, maar wat ik onder andere zo in, in hem uh, waardeer, is dat hij de nuance zoekt, ja. durft te zoeken. Ja. Hij vindt zichzelf een man van het midden, heeft hij wel eens gezegd. En uh, daar heb je ook een zekere moed voor nodig. Dominee Schuler heeft mijn leven gered toen ik twaalf jaar was. Toen ik voor de trein wou springen en er een einde aan wou maken. En toevallig naar zijn uitzending keek en hem hoorde zeggen, God loves you and so do I. In zijn ogen zag ik de liefde van God en dat heeft mij gered. De momenten daar dat je in zo'n cel onderin zo'n gerechtsgebouw zit, neergestoken, al een paar dagen geen drugs gebruikt, terwijl je dat uh, uh, altijd gewend was. Dat zijn allemaal momenten die ik nog zo goed kan herinneren. Dat, dat is zo eenzaam, zo, zo diep onder de grond voor je gevoel, zo ver weg van alles ja. en iedereen die ooit van je gehouden hebt en van God. En God heeft je uit het vuur gerukt, hè? Ja. Het is soms onrealistisch, nu je al jaren dicht bij Jezus leeft, en zijn vrede ervaart, kan je niet meer voorstellen hoe het is om, om in zo'n leven te zitten. Dat, uh, ja, dat is wat God doet, die verandert je, die, die geeft je een nieuw leven. En hoe is dat gebeurd? Door de oude of power. <laughs> Ik zepte daar voorbij en het was gewoon heel apart. Dat beeld was anders dan de andere beelden. Als je alleen bezig bent met de buitenkant, dan komt er natuurlijk een ongelooflijke leegte. Dat kan niet, want de buitenkant is natuurlijk vergankelijk en betekent ook niets. Maar als er... Um, een, 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 een basis is van dat je je verzorgt aan de buitenkant, maar dat je ook aan je binnenkant werkt, dan kan het natuurlijk wel. Die man die heeft tegen mij gezegd, turn your scars into stars. Weet je wel? En, van die uh, ja, wonden in wonderen. Van die wonden in wonderen. Dat is toch ja. prachtig? Wat is jouw wens voor uh, Out of Power? Ja, dat heel veel mensen die rust kunnen vinden, die ik ook gevonden heb. In, mede door de Hour of Power. Waarom Hour of Power? Wat mij boeit is de manier waarop zij het evangelie presenteren. Dat ze een feest ervan maken. Dat was het eerst van mijn leven dat ik halleluja riep. En dat ik wist wat het betekende. Gewoon prijs God. Want zijn liefde was daar in één keer. Ik werd overstroomd door blijdschap, door geluk. Ik, ik voelde echt als een mantel die van je schouder glijdt. Zo die, die duisternis van depressie voelde ik wegglijden. En... Uh, ik voelde de vloek gewoon verbroken worden, dat ik 21 zou worden. En wat een, wat een uitstraling naar de wereld toe, van hoeveel mensen zien het niet Wel. per zondag over de hele wereld. Nou, ik vind het een geweldig uh, visitekaartje wat daar wordt uh, neergelegd. Dat is geweldig. Ja. Een van jouw uitspraken is dat niet voetbal, maar geloven een topsport is. Absoluut, ja. Ja, geloven, dat is echt een topsport. En ik heb dat gezegd toen een beetje in de, in de tijd van mijn carrière, dat ik uh, ook nog zoekende was. En, uh, en, en met name hou vast dat aan de Bijbel lezen, bidden. En ik ging wat minder naar de kerk. Ik zei altijd, dat zijn de drie basisdingen dat je echt dicht bij de Heere God kan blijven wandelen. Die, die kloof die gekomen was tussen de mens en God, want hij houdt ontzettend veel van ons. Die heeft hij weer geslecht en is weer een brug gekomen. En wij mogen zelf kiezen om die brug over te steken om weer bij hem te komen. This is Holland, known for the beautiful gardens like here in the Keukenhof. 
where even two tulips are named after Dr. Schuler and Arvella. Hello, my name is Louis Poel. I'm the director for the Hour of Power in the Netherlands. We're a small country with about 16 million inhabitants and 5.6 million households with a TV set. Every Sunday, the program is broadcast by a commercial television station called RTL5. And through this station, the Hour of Power reaches people in places where no one comes. People's lives get changed overnight. En toen kwam een bijzonder moment voor jou. Ik zat eigenlijk een beetje in kommer en kwel, slecht geslapen. En ik ben op een bank beneden gaan zitten. Ik denk, nou, ik ga eens even kijken wat er op de televisie is. En ik sapte zo recht op Henry Nouwen af met de Hour of Power. Ik was ook in één keer genezen voor mijn gevoel. Nee, ik denk dat Gods liefde zo diep gaat. En dat mensen zich gaan realiseren dat je van waarde bent. En dat, dat is zo belangrijk. Dat je weet dat je diep geliefd bent. En vanuit die... Wetenschap ga je anders denken en anders doen. En dat verandert je leven. Wat had die man een passie voor God en een passie voor mensen? Ik vind toch dat hij wel heel erg veel betekend heeft... voor miljoenen miljoenen mensen wereldwijd... om op een positieve manier de boodschap van Christus te belichten. Centraal te stellen. Zoveel mensen als hij bereikt zal hebben. En ja, we weten niet wat er in harten is veranderd... maar dit soort dingen zijn toch wel heel erg mooi. En uh, ja, ook zelf kijk ik daar toch zeker met dankbaarheid naar terug... Het is zo duidelijk, de innerlijke rust die ik ontving, is niet van deze wereld. Dat is een hemelse rust waar ik weet dat heel de wereld naar die rust verlangt. En ik zal mijn mond er niet meer over houden voordat ik het iedereen verteld heb. Ik ben helemaal enthousiast over het programma. Is dat nog steeds zo? Oh ja, absoluut. Dat is natuurlijk niet meer weg te slaan. Dus iedere zondag... Uh, zit ik trouw voor de buis en ik ben heel erg blij met dat extra uurtje. Mijn oproep eigenlijk aan de kijkers is uh, die in vrijheid dit programma mogen zien. Waardeer dat je in vrijheid leeft en deel Gods liefde uit. In hele simpele dingen, door aandacht te geven, kaartje te schrijven aan iemand, liefde te geven. Dat is mijn uh, ja. ding wat ik tegen kijkers wil zeggen. En ik, ik ben van overtuigd dat je met liefde geven het grote verschil in deze wereld maakt. And to fill the world with love. And to fill the world with love. My whole life through. Wij sluiten deze bijzondere uitzending van Hour of Power in verband met het overlijden van Dominic Schuller af met een van de toespraken die hij hield in de Crystal Cathedral. Hij werd een prins onder de predikers genoemd en wist altijd de gevoelige snaar te raken. En ook altijd op een hele originele manier dingen te verklaren en te vertellen. We zijn nu erkentelijk voor uw medeleven en blijft u met ons in contact via onze website www.ourofpower.nl. Daar kunt u ook op ons condoleantenregister tekenen. We denken in het bijzonder aan degene die hij achterlaat, zijn kinderen. En we wensen hun godskracht nabijheid en zegen toe. Psalm 61 begins with these words. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Wow. I've never preached on this text, but last Sunday I was sitting here and Robert, my son, was reading the scripture and that verse was in the scripture reading and it felt like a thunderbolt went through me. I've lived with it all week and have to speak on it with you this morning. Lead me to the rock. Who said this? Why did he say it? Where was he coming from? Well, the author is David and It's the same David, a shepherd boy. He loved to play the harp. He loved the sheep. And he came to the attention of King Saul, who had his own neuro neurological problems, he was a mentally sick character. And he wanted David to play for him, and he did. And you know how the story ends. Well, it really begins when Samuel the prophet tells King Saul, David is to be the next king, not your son. 
Well, his son was limp. And on his first day as king, David called the appropriate heir, the son, to see him. The son was hiding, trying to escape. He knew that the new king would kill him. But he was captured, brought to David, and David said, you are the rightful heir to this throne that was given to me. You now have nothing. Be my guest, live in my home. We will love you and take care of you. That's David, he's a wonderful, wonderful person until he got control and power. It's often been said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if you want to read the real story, which I wouldn't want to read from this pulpit in 2 Samuel, it reads awful like a soap opera. I mean, there's sex, there's violence, there's deception, there's duplicity. It's awful. This wonderful little child, what he became. When he got power, he began to believe he was in control. He had the power and he no longer depended so reverently, mystically, and quietly on the Almighty God for his strength. He already had it. Or he didn't need to depend on God for power. He had it. He didn't need to depend on God for success. He was a success. Well, where does that change of attitude lead him? It leads him into trouble. And in trouble, finally, he's asking the question, lead me, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Wow. In this, what was his problem? I think in one word, I would call it, he was overwhelmed. <laughs> you ever had that overwhelmed feeling? Uh, what was he overwhelmed with? Not with enemies that were going to dethrone him. No, he was overwhelmed. I made about five points. It's, first, he was overwhelmed by temptation. Very conspicuous. There's never been a king that did anything worse than David when he saw the beautiful Bathsheba wanted her and had her husband appointed to the front of the line when the attack was made in war. So the odds of him being killed were substantial. And in fact, it worked out. And so she was widowed and he took her to be his wife. He was overwhelmed with this temptation. And I think our culture is finding a lot of people overwhelmed by temptations. He was overwhelmed then by guilt. You can never read a more penitent piece of poetry than Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. If you ever feel guilty and you will, so do I, read Psalm 51. It's so therapeutic. Lead me to a rock. I can hold on to it and I will not be shaken into sin through temptation. Lead me to a rock. And a rock that can guarantee that I can be pardoned. You know, religion has, through the centuries, offered all kinds of solutions to guilt, at least perceived solutions. But many of them are unstable. Most of them depend upon you paying a price. It's what's called in theology salvation by works. It doesn't work because there's no grace. It was Martin Luther who had a terrible problem with guilt. And he did everything the church said you should do. And he followed the ritual and he followed the church law. And finally he was still as guilty as hell. And he walked up the steps on his knees praying for forgiveness. And he was led to the Bible verse, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, it's a gift of God. You feel guilty. Go to the God of mercy and love. Wow. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. All other ground is sinking sand. 
he was overwhelmed by temptation. And then, of course, guilt. And then, of course, overwhelmed by grief. Sure, he got the beautiful Bathsheba. He got her. And she lost her child, their child. He got Bathsheba. They had a son named Absalom who would be taken away in a pitiful death later on. Always there's guilt mixed in with grief. I used to do a lot of counseling in my younger years and through funerals of beloved church members and every time someone is in grief, there tends to be guilt mixed into it. Most often undeserved. In this case with David, it was deserved. Overwhelmed by grief. Lead me to the rock that I can hold on to. A wonderful friend of mine is having problems today. And he said, I don't think I ever got over losing my son. Grief overwhelms you. It takes you along. It's a wonderful member of this church uh, sent me a beautiful story. Hadley, are you here this morning? Or is he at the 11 o'clock service? Stand up so they know that I'm telling the truth, please. They know your face because this is an unbelievable story. That's one of our greatest church members. You know, he said one Friday morning, he's one of our great volunteers, you know, and he was on tour guide duty. And uh, suddenly there was nobody here. He saw a man come up. And he, could, he said, seeing that man come up, I could see he was not a possibility thinker. And he approached me and he didn't look very happy. I asked if he'd ever heard of the Hour of Power. He said, yeah, I watched it once. I said, would you like a tour? Sure, but let me tell you right up front where I'm coming from. I said, okay, lay it on me. He spent 10 minutes telling me everything that was wrong here. What a disgraceful expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. He laid it all out. I said, well, you know, I've been around here for 32 years and believe me, you're not the only one that's found fault with this ministry, but why don't we take a walk around a bit and let's see if I can change your mind. <laughs> he scoffed and said, you would have one tough time. I spent one hour and 45 minutes with that guy. The miracle was nobody else joined us. We were alone for that entire time. He was kind of impressed when I told him this whole thing started with a young man and his wife who had $500 and a little organ they pulled halfway across the country. and They had a dream to build a church and tell people that God loved them. Would you believe it started in a drive-in movie theater? He smiled a little and said, you're telling me things I really don't care to hear. Pointed out the walk of faith. Many people, many whom we don't know, paid to have a Bible verse carved in granite and put in the sidewalk so people can't even walk around here without the possibility of reading the Bible. Wow. Then, I, then we saw the Crystal Cathedral and I said, you know, one Saturday afternoon, about 22 years ago, this thing has just been finished, my wife and I met a young man with his wife. And that man told us, he didn't belong here, but he had to show his wife the place that put food on their table when he so desperately needed a job. He was a glazier and said he helped put all that glass in place. At the Good Shepherd statue, I told him we'd once found a note of confession placed at the feet of Jesus. Then he volunteered. He said, you know, that was probably from someone who'd carried a weight of sin for years. And when they laid it at Jesus' feet, they left here as if a ton of weight had been lifted from their shoulders. And then he told me. He told me. 
many years ago. His nine-year-old son died of cancer. And he said, I became totally alienated from God. Overwhelmed by grief. And he said, yeah, I can hardly believe what's been happening to me since I entered this place earlier this morning. Wow. I said, let's have a prayer. And just then the phone rang and it was his wife. Her meeting was over. She wanted to get together and have lunch. <laughs> he said, I prayed that he, he and his wife would be blessed and always sense the presence of Jesus. And when we finished praying, he showed me the goosebumps on his arm and said, you know what that is? It, I think it represents the Holy Spirit. And I said, you're right. And I showed him the same goosebumps on my arm. Overwhelmed. Some of you still are overwhelmed by grief. Subconsciously, you think you pushed it away, but it's doing danger. Overwhelmed by temptation, overwhelmed by guilt, overwhelmed by grief, and then overwhelmed by threats. Yes, he, David had his enemies, but the real threat to his life was his sense of power and control. He had to have it. He had to be in charge. Does life throw a curve at you? Are you in a battle to win, to hold, to exercise power and control in your family, in your marriage, in your career, in your profession, in politics, in finances? You are the boss. You're the king. It can overwhelm you until you don't hear people. I don't feel what people are feeling. How about you? Do you feel overwhelmed once in a while? Maybe this morning, maybe last week. I heard a story the other day. It was kind of funny about a man and wife. They were overwhelmed by a disagreement. And they got into a period where they didn't even talk to each other. They just pouted. They would not speak speak a word to each other until one night he was going to go to bed and he remembered he was going to go fishing the next morning. He had to get up at 5 a.m. but he wouldn't tell his wife. He left a note on her pillow. Wake me up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> he woke up at 9 o'clock. <laughs> Boy was he mad. And he saw a note on the pillow. It's five o'clock, time to get up. <laughs> you know, some are overwhelmed by papers, some by projects, some by people, some by problems, some by possibilities. Overwhelmed by talent, opportunities, possibility thinking. Yes, lead me to the rock. So I will make the right decision for my life. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. Or maybe you're overwhelmed by a collision of insecurities. Maybe they're conscious. Like, where's my money going? How much did I lose? Will I have enough? More, more, more. When is enough enough? Where does this spirit lead? Yes, to greed. And that doesn't produce joy. Overwhelmed by a collision of insecurity. Lead me to a rock. The Bible does this. It teaches us that if we give 10% of our money to God, we don't have to worry about the other 90%, but if you don't give the 10, you will never be satisfied with whatever you keep. It's a decision you have to make. Overwhelmed by a collision, conscious and unconscious. A lot of our overwhelming insecurities are not conscious, but subconsciously, will this marriage hold? 
Will it survive? Will my children turn out okay? How about my grandkids? How can they grow up in this kind of a world and not be morally corrupt? Lead me to a rock that is higher than I, Lord. Lord. And then you worry, maybe consciously or surely unconsciously, about the ultimate insecurity. It's called death and dying. Because nobody talks about it. It's not happy news. Oh, it's happy news if you know Jesus Christ. Because here for sure, I can give you a rock that is eternal. Hold on to it. Well, lead me to the rock. That was a prayer. Question, was the prayer answered? How was it answered? When was it answered? Read 2 Samuel. And David found a rock. It was a solid island in a stormy sea. Fast forward. Listen to the poet. He found a solid rock. And he, he put it in these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Amen. That's the faith I offer to you. That's the solid rock. Oh, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. In the evening of my life, I shall look to the sunset. At that moment in my life, when the night is due, and the question I shall ask, only God can answer, was I brave?